Let's get it on then, shall we? Mwah. Welcome to Sex on the Peach, your weekly hump day dose of everyone's favourite untalked about topic, sex. Let's get honest, let's get open, let's get comfortable, and let's get in to this week's show. Good morning everyone, happy hump day, and welcome to another episode of Sex on the Peach. I'm your host Peach and today's conversation is the first in a series of ongoing chats with parents about sex after children, a topic that seems to be relentlessly avoided. Obviously everyone's birth story and sexual journey post that is completely different and completely individual to them. And so today I will be speaking to my gorgeous friend Natasha Barnes about her experiences. Natasha gave birth via emergency C-section and is also no longer in a sexual relationship with the father of their child. So today we discuss navigating sex again as a newly single mother, reclaiming your body, and the pressure on women and vulva owners to be content with motherhood and motherhood only. And as always, we also take some of your questions. So here we go. Here is Let's Talk About Sex After Baby. Natasha, thank you so much for joining me today on Sex on the Peach. It is a huge pleasure to have you because so many people have been waiting for a conversation on this topic. So thank you for joining me. And today we will be speaking about sex after childbirth and children. How do you feel, Tash? (laughs) I feel good. I never thought I'd be on a sex podcast about children and childbirth. (laughs) I thought it would be one of the one of the more kinky ones, <laughs> but I'm quite I'm happy to be here. Yeah, <laughs> this is where this is where life has taken us. Yeah, but it yeah. has been a highly anticipated topic. I've had a lot of people writing and asking when this conversation will happen, and although it is an ongoing one, thank you for being the first mother to come and speak with me. I'm excited. So to start, how old is your child now? He is bang on four and a half. Okay. Now, so he's just started school. It feels like a lifetime, but also five minutes. It's really strange. Okay. So we've got a wealth of time post childbirth to talk about the sexual adventures that have been. (laughs) Yes, adventures also. (laughs) Yeah. The reintroduction into sexual life <laughs> post childbirth. Oh um, God, yeah. Um, and also, just so the listeners know, you are no longer in a sexual relationship with your child's father. Yeah, yeah, we're best mates. I mean, yeah, you never say never, but right now we're best mates. <laughs> we get on really well, and we sort of see each other every day. But obviously, that sort of element of our relationship didn't work out, and mm-hmm. um, we've sort of. Uh, been growing our lives around each other in other ways to sort of keep the partnership up for for Alvi and I I count myself really lucky it's a really at present a really healthy sort of stable relationship that I'm really proud of and that is really dear to me but it's not a romantic relationship so I'm technically single (laughs) but I think this is like such an important conversation because we talk about sex after childbirth and people just assume that we're talking about that relationship that happens with your partner after you've had a child together but the navigating single life again and navigating yourself as a single sexual woman after having a baby is its own complete world so it's hard to sort of sum it up in in a question but how has that felt for you and has that felt (laughs) complete you know how I guess I guess really the question is how has it felt different than navigating the world as a single woman without a child I guess it's sort of uh, you know we we were talking about this earlier that every birth story is different and a lot Mm -hmm. of mums out there will relate that once you get pregnant and you start talking to people that are are mothers or or friends who have friends that are mothers and there's always a birth story there's always a story of 
trauma and horror or there's a story that's gone really well and it's I think I think people's reintroduction if you will back into sort of sex after having a baby is the same as, as a birth story they're all completely different mm-hmm. um my birth story is really traumatic I nearly died my son nearly died um it was pretty horrendous so on top of dealing with that trauma for me it mm. was a bit traumatic that my romantic relationship didn't work out because obviously you're very, 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 very vulnerable when you've just had a baby and you don't recognise yourself in so many ways. You know, you're kind of living with a strange little human and also you're a stranger yourself in a way. Mm -hmm. So then to be sort of, I think, you know, part of what what dimmed was the sort of physical attraction on on his side. I don't think he'll mind me saying that. And that was something that didn't work out and kind of reconciling with that left me in a place where I just had no idea how to bounce back from that at all it's like mm. the ultimate rejection at your lowest point and and it's not his fault but it's what happened sure <laughs> so you know going from feeling like really far away from ever wanting anything like that and you know could I ever do that again I you then get the massive rush of hormones which tell you that you must have sex with anything or everything like it's it's right. ridiculous what happens to your body and what happens to your brain <laughs> um so you go from not wanting anything and not wanting anyone to touch you at all like don't literally don't come near me don't even <laughs> breathe on me to like don't exist to, like do you do you have do you have a pulse would you like to have sex it's literally like it, it's amazing like the the way it swings um and I wasn't prepared for that I don't think what was the sort of time frame of that switch um I think about three or four months in I think I wanted to feel close Mm -hmm. to someone and like there were a couple of instances where that happened but it didn't it wasn't like it was a closeness thing it was Mm -hmm. an intimacy thing rather than like a sex thing and then for me I got really terrible postnatal depression and I went back to work uh, on a show when I like I was like 12 weeks pregnant I was sorry Alvy was 12 weeks old gosh that's so soon I went back to work yeah, I forced myself back to work because I wanted to prove a point and I was scared. Right. And I shouldn't have done that. I don't mm-hmm. think I should have held my horses. And I don't think I would do that again. But I think it was sort of after, yeah, being personally depressed and then putting on a load of weight. And because it, it wasn't the pregnancy where I lost track of my body, I kind of, the trauma just made me kind of overeat and sure. I then sort of recognized my body changing and then I didn't like my body personally my personal preference I wasn't happy with the way I looked on top of all of the rejection and stuff and I think it sort of went away for a bit and then when I was about eight months old I just suddenly just wanted to just have sex with everything <laughs> and anything like literally like I couldn't like I couldn't watch Love Island I couldn't like I couldn't do anything without just being like ridic- ridiculously turned on by everything it was wow. really weird and bizarre but yeah it's a it's a strange it's a strange first year that, that year mm. that getting through all those milestones I think did you and your ex-partner the father of your child have a sexual relationship after you gave birth at all before you separated or was that sort of um, not something that developed again for you both I think it was just something that never really got back off the ground and I mean Mm -hmm. I think every human being with a penis is different aren't they of course some partners really like that during a pregnancy as well like it's okay to have sex during pregnancy I had sex during my pregnancy it was fine but again you know and you always say you're such a big advocate for communication and I think that's part of the problem was that like with so much going up in the air and the stakes being so high and so much life changes going underway you know we didn't communicate very much and right. so it just became something that we did out of routine rather than a thing. And then that was part of a drift that then sort of just kept on going. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it wasn't, it, it just sort of started dying slowly, really, all of that sort of part of the relationship, which was really sad. And I was sort of watching it happen and I couldn't do mm-hmm. anything about it because also I wasn't getting any sleep and I was trying to work yeah. and I was trying to keep this little human alive. And um, I had a C-section so again, like I find the word childbirth really difficult because I don't feel like I gave birth. Like I sort of, I was put right. under general anaesthetic. So I sort of went to sleep and then woke up and there was this human that was like meant to be my baby. And I sort of was meant to take that as red because like I never met him consciously. Like I had to wait about 
seven hours to meet him. Right. So okay. like the idea of childbirth, again, it's so personal, depending on how your birth mm-hmm. went. Like I never had that. Like it was a sunroof situation. Sure. So for me, like my return to getting back in my body felt different to how I would imagine somebody that, you know, managed to get in the birthing pool and stuff, which is what I wanted. And I wanted to do all the hypnobirthing and be really calm. But really, I was just watching Ricky Gervais and swearing like a sailor. And then it all went really wrong. <laughs> I was going to say, was your so your C-section wasn't planned? No, no I okay. really wanted it natural. So you natural. had planned to have a vaginal birth? Yeah, and, um, and everything had been really textbook as well for me. Like everything went textbook in the pregnancy. It was fine. And okay. my waters broke at the pub. My little boy's dad <laughs> said something really funny. Genuinely, he's and he is to this day the person that makes me laugh most in the world. And he said something hilarious. And I laughed and then went, oh, crap, I've... I've wet myself, I've weaved myself, fuck. <laughs> and, then I, and then it sort of wouldn't stop. And I was like, oh no, no, this is me on a main road in a pub, outside a country pub with my lemonade and I've, I've my waters have broke. Great, it's good. So yeah, it was all like really, really, you don't get a lot of waters breaking like that. A lot of the time you have to have your waters broken for you. So it's, it was quite cool. It was quite magical actually in a way. Gosh, I didn't, I think in TV shows we always see yeah. that kind of thing happen. So I, obviously I don't have any children. I presumed everyone's waters are breaking yeah. in pubs and on the street and in shops and- yeah it's 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 not as common I think as people that as people realize like people think it's really common but it's not and that happened yeah and then it all just went really like yeah it went south and then there's this other funny thing that like sort of happened after having him it's like I I still struggle with it now the urge to like scream that I like had a c-section and that I'd I've never birthed a baby through my vagina. Like, there's this thing where I want to, like, tell everyone that. It's really weird. I don't know what that is. I don't think that's... I don't... Again, as I always try and sound this, I don't I don't think anything is weird. We're probably just... You know, we're taught things are weird because we're made to feel like we're the only people who feel certain ways. And I think there has been... In the same way that there's pressure on women to breastfeed mm-hmm. and women who don't are, are still completely wrongly looked down on quite often by other women which I is something I cannot get my head around but I think there's that pressure on women and vulva owners to feel like that's the right way to birth a child in the same way that we are Mm. taught there's right ways to have sex and right ways to have relationships and right ways to parent and right ways to do this that or the other and I don't know about you when I had the very very limited maybe one hour of sex education that I did in school and they covered basically this is how you make a baby when they discussed a woman or vulva owner giving birth there wasn't oh or they can have this thing called a c-section yeah and (laughs) you know and then even even then when you you go on your pregnancy journey and you start reading about the different types of birth and I try to really plan for the unplannable mm-hmm. as much as I could sure. and I thought oh you know there is a chance that this could develop in in a way that take that means that I can't have the baby the way I want to and maybe I will have mm-hmm. to have a c-section you never imagine that it's going to be eight people surgeons running into the room that you're in and yeah, saying I'm really sorry we just need you to scroll your consent on this thing and we need to put you under like that's you never imagine that that's going to happen. No. Um, you know, you think C-section, you think that lovely little towel there and you're lying there going, oh yeah, I'm ready, I can't feel anything, it's fine. And you think that that's the way that a C-section goes. But there are so many different outcomes. And I do believe that somebody's sexual identity is very dependent upon the birthing experience. And, and each birthing right. experience is so different. I do believe that it really changes... Because for me, I've always been really lucky in my life. I've never had any operations or been terribly sick. Um, So that was Mm -hmm. that was the first time I ever had surgery, the first time I ever went under general anaesthetic. And then I woke up with a baby that was I was also told very, very nearly didn't make it. So and was in special care baby unit. So for me, like it was it's an immense amount of trauma. And then there was the emotional trauma of my relationship breaking down, which followed that. And then the trauma of going back to work because I felt like I had to, Mm -hmm. you know, coming out of all that and then getting back into your body again. Yeah, refinding yourself sexually. And someone else and share like an experience with someone else. When you sort of tick it all off, it's actually quite a big deal. Yeah, it's a minefield of emotions and hormones, obviously, which, as we all know, throughout pregnancy, after giving birth, like they're out of control, (laughs) you know. Yeah, mad, mad hormone situation I think I've 
I've got polycystic ovaries and I think that's that's probably something that quite a lot of people will, will know and understand. Mm-hmm. So my hormones were always like that anyway. Sure. And also I think it, um, the process of ageing as a woman, you know, we're so underserved in the world of medicine in terms of our f- yeah. fertility health and, our, and, and women's health in general. We, you know, so much of, of modern medicine is geared towards men and, and everything is scaled down to fit a woman and it's so not right. So yeah, our absolutely. bodies work so differently. You know, I have conversations with friends now saying I get more hormonal when I'm ovulating than I do actually on my period. And it's and things like that mm-hmm. really change after having a baby as well. You do you really feel like I go I go a bit ballistic when I'm when I'm ovulating and then um a new thing for me since having Alvi is that I get insomnia when I have my period. I can't sleep. I go through a week right. of not being able to sleep. And it's it's really strange the way that the body changes after having a baby, but also as we age and it's just not understood. And I think the more you understand it and the more you can understand it with a, if you have a long term partner, if you have that understanding between you and that acceptance, then I think it's yeah. something that can really help in terms of like intimacy. And I digress. Yeah. Think. not at all no not at all it's so important because there's so little education on that and especially when you mention periods we're never taught about how our bodies react to ovulation we're taught about what happens during our period but never you know I, I say taught ish mm. but never about what happens during ovulation it was years before I sort of you know understood that certain things were happening at certain times of the month because of that and it wasn't my period that information isn't out there and as I always try and say I don't blame men and penis owners because they also weren't given the information Mm. what I do think is there's no excuse now because the information is out there for us to find and research and listen to and there are conversations to be had so when we look back through the way especially our generation the way we were educated I don't blame people for not having known things and not having understood things. My issue is when people are not willing to learn now, those conversations can be had. And I just think we shouldn't be shying away from them. So I think it's really important that men do understand how women's bodies work. And it should be not and it should be uh, um, it should be normalized as well. And I think it yeah. And I think I definitely feel it should be respected as well. Like there's nothing worse than, mm-hmm. you know, someone going, Oh you you're on your period because of a a fluctuation right. in your mood or or is it that time of the month yeah like I don't I don't understand that it's science well what do we get to say back to men like they're always fucking moving do you yeah. know what I mean well yeah it's I mean it's 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 really it is something that needs to be normalized and and I think I think there needs to be a more you know a level of of, of respect there for for the fact that you know we don't stay the same we mm-hmm. fluctuate that's it okay so after having your son mm-hmm. How long was it before you first had sex again? Yeah, I think it was like about three months. Mm -hmm. And it was just a couple of times. And then I was single Mm -hmm. after that. Okay. It was fine. (laughs) I was literally just about to say, and And how how did that go? (laughs) In like, Um, with like, I think in a really profound tone. (laughs) How was that for you? Fine. It's fine. I mean, you're... (laughs) You're so tired. I was not expecting the cavalier and it was fine. (laughs) (laughs) I think like you're so tired. Like my memories of that period are so fleeting anyway. Um, You're so tired. It's like an accomplishment of closeness is is how I would put it personally. But Mm -hmm. like, I I mean, I I would say that like it was probably about a year before my head was like in the sex game again, if that makes any Mm -hmm, sense. mm -hmm. And I was really into like the experience itself because at that point it became about something else for me. And you know, sex can mean different things. We have sex for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think that's personally, I think that's okay. I think it's okay to have it for an emotional reason or for closeness or for intimacy. And then sometimes you just want to like have it off. Get fucked. Absolutely get ravaged. (laughs) (laughs) And I think like it took about a year to feel like I wanted to get ravaged again. (laughs) Sorry, mother. (laughs) (laughs) The first time that you did um, have sex again after on a purely physical basis, was it painful? Did it feel different? Or did you feel that sort of it it felt relatively the same. It was well. I think I think it was anti anticlimactic in a way because you think that like your everything else in your world has changed, right? And your body has mm-hmm. changed forever. Personally, having had a C section, etc., it felt the same. It didn't feel sure. any different. And and I think there was mm-hmm. like I did have a little bit of a worry about like, oh, what if those stitches haven't healed, or what if that scar's not that? You know, you 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 get those worries and you do worry mm-hmm. about things like that. But they're only they're only like a fleeting 
moment because you know what what's happening in the present moment has always been more important to me than my head I'm quite good at doing that compartmentalizing yeah for the sake of being like in the present moment in a situation like that so it was only ever a fleeting thing of oh that but it's not all change it doesn't feel I mean I've I've spoken with friends close friends that like really went the other way and just couldn't bear to to be touched because the other thing about childbirth and and having a child and that first you know what they they call the the fourth trimester so the first kind of couple of Mm -hmm. months after uh, having your baby you are being touched and pulled and poked and prodded every second of the day. I had someone right, else's okay. skin on my skin 24-7. I mean, my son wouldn't mm-hmm. sleep lying down. He had to sleep sitting up. So he was always on one of us. He was always sat up. We like. I mean, I do not know how <laughs> you're meant to do anything other than feed mm-hmm. the baby, rock the baby, change the baby sleep the baby, <laughs> speak to the baby, introduce the baby to other people and then do it all over again. Like there are friends of mine who have had such a, a severe reaction to the, the feeling of just constantly being invaded. And then you're dealing with breastfeeding as well. Mm. I found myself in a really lucky position mentally where I didn't put myself under any pressure to breastfeed. And good, um, good. I just couldn't be asked with it in terms <laughs> of the pressure. And I really wanted to give it a good go. And he was really good, Alvi. But then I had a load of problems with that because of the way that he'd been born and he was carrying a lot of tension and then that affects the way that they breastfeed and then it really hurts and Mm -hmm. then awful, awful things start happening to your boobs. The boobs is one of the things that my friends who have had children talk about a lot and the way that it's a part of your body that has been sexualized for literally your entire life until you have a baby. Well, for me, it was just like, they were just, it was just like a pain palace for like (laughs) six weeks. It was horrific. And my whole day would be about Mm. the pain of breastfeeding. But I was like, so down to be that mum that literally didn't care and would sit in the cafe and like not, I was, because I'm really, I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it's an amazing thing. But my day would be, I would be crying half an hour up to the feed. I would cry through the feed. I would cry afterwards because I'd be scared of the next time because it was so painful. And like, you know, like my nipples bleeding and oh, it's just, it it was, I'm like tensing even thinking about it. It was really hard. It was really hard. Well, it's not this magical thing that it's not easy we're all made it's to believe. so hard it's not easy it's an art yeah. and you're and you're going maybe this position doesn't work maybe that should maybe I should do that and then you've got your mother saying try this one and then you've got someone else saying try that and you're kind of going yeah but it, mm. it's not it, 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 I can't fix this I can't it's I don't and in the end I just stopped and um we we dive off and, and he was a lot happier and I was a lot happier and I was going to say because if you're constantly in pain whilst feeding your child like I you know I have to sort of believe a child can probably sense the stress to a degree you know yeah 100%. so this pressure is just so nonsensical because for a start it's, it's someone's choice anyway but so many people I know have have been like I felt like under so much pressure to make it work and it just wasn't happening and it was painful or it wasn't working that way and it sort of ruined their sort of initial start into parenting because they were so worried about breastfeeding that it sort of took time away from other things. I just think it's something that as a society, we need to stop putting pressure on women for and just stop assuming it's this like beautiful, magical thing. And there isn't pain and, and stress and, and issues involved no, with it. absolutely and like you have your good days and your bad days with 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 early motherhood and and that is one of the things that contributes to your good days and your bad days and I think and and this is this is again like that whole mind body connection you are so connected to this little human being and so much of your physical energy is 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 going on this child and picking up signals mm-hmm. from this child and this child is picking up signals from you I always felt and I and I stand by this I always felt so much empathy for the partner of the person giving birth to the baby and hand bearing the baby and and feeding the baby because so much is is out of their control and it must be mm-hmm. it must be a really flummoxing difficult thing to have to stand mm-hmm. essentially on the sidelines and you know i mean w- w- in my situation uh, it was an unplanned pregnancy it wasn't it wasn't planned we've sure. not been together very long and i mean you know, I'm not, I wasn't sat on six years of getting to know somebody inside out and being totally in with them. And, and I didn't have that. Mm-hmm. That role is, is such a difficult role to be the, to be the person that has to sort of fetch and carry 
and protect but sure. can't, you know you can't he couldn't do anything <laughs> he, could, he couldn't do it for me and 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 mm-hmm. that's that must be really difficult and I think you know that's why it's it's so important to feel supported by the people that are around you and having a support system whether that's you know family or friends you, you know you, mm-hmm. you can't Absolutely. do it on your own you, you can't do it on your own how was the first time you got ravaged again <laughs> <laughs> oh it's it, <laughs> um it was funny like <laughs> it was fine Honestly, first one was fine your answers are killing me it was fine how was the first time you got ravaged again it's it funny. was funny it's funny um <laughs> You've got to have a sense of humour about these things. 100%. Um, listen, I'm all about, with, I've said it before, <laughs> laughing during sex ain't no bad thing. I don't think so anyway. Look, I, I will be completely honest. I got to a point where I just decided I just really, really needed a really good night. Mm-hmm. I just selected somebody that I really trust and really liked and had known mm-hmm. for a long time. And I sort of knew it would be good. And I created mm-hmm. it for myself because... Honestly, the chance to go out and organically meet somebody when you are somebody that holds down a career, holds down a child, holds down a house, you know, there's so, there's been so much that's been negotiated. And obviously, yeah. I don't, I also don't live in London anymore. And that is the beating heart of where my life was based and all my people. Mm-hmm. And if I wanted to go and meet somebody new, I'd go out. And now so much is on the apps, yeah. which I've never been on, but it, there, there are limited ways to be honest on those apps. My worry and my concern for myself is that, you know, you're not, you might not want to pick up somebody that's openly honest about being a single mum and the types of people. It's all about what you want to attract, I suppose. Yeah. And for me, I just can't, I have to develop an in-person connection with someone. I'm not an app person and I'm a terrible Mm -hmm. saleswoman terrible so even with the help of 500 friends like my profile would just look awful and I just I just (laughs) couldn't bear it so in the end I just set something up that was Mm -hmm. safe and that I knew and then obviously I lost my nerve and so obviously I got a little bit drunk and probably talked too much listen we don't have to have had kids who have done that do you know what I mean like we've all been there you return to the same behavior it's like there's this little part of you that hasn't changed this little part of you that you you don't realize is there Mm -hmm. and I think I'm not sure if it's the same for somebody in a in a relationship that has survived getting pregnant having a pregnancy giving birth and then going back with that same person I don't know what that experience is like I can't testify to it for me like this little Mm -hmm. part of that person before I had my child was back and that was really nice it was nice to connect with that person that had that was a little bit more carefree and you know wasn't too worried about you know how long how long have we got like what's the you know it's because that's that's the nature of being a parent is it how, how long have we got is sort of the the way you negotiate through your day and and if you're sure. on a date you need to be back for the babysitter and it's it's always a countdown so it was nice to like not have to think about any of that and nothing's changed down there <laughs> nothing's um, changed down yeah. there <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems a lot of and I know obviously that wasn't your choice but a lot of women are actually electing to try and have c-sections because what is mental again isn't it comes down to sort of like societal pressure on women is like yeah no you must give vaginal birth but you must yeah, also whatever happens. your vagina mustn't change <laughs> You know, so it's like, well, hang on, what one do you want? Things change. Like sometimes people have to have stitches. Sometimes this, that or the other happens. No one's vagina just like gets through birth completely unscathed. (laughs) And it would be ridiculous to think otherwise. So because of that pressure, now women are saying... I can I do okay know, well I, then I'll have a c-section I, res- I respect the decision like before I had my son I like I knew my vagina like I knew my vulva. I knew it like the back of my hand I know the shape of it mm-hmm. I know I, I know exactly what I need I can imagine that have it you know if I was to have like fully birthed Alvi without any complications and needing a c-section I wonder if I would be not on speaking terms with my vagina for a little while. Like, not sure. Do you know what I mean? So I can understand you wanting to, when it comes to intimacy and when it comes to sex, like wanting to know that part of you isn't going to change and it's going to feel the same for you. I really respect that. So one of the things that I hear most is, like you've mentioned before, loss of sexual identity and feeling like your body belongs to someone else in a very different way. Obviously, I know that Alvi's a little older now, so it may be that that feels it feels more like that towards the beginning when 
your body is needed by that human again in a different way. But do you sort of feel like you have that separation for your body? Yeah. As in like yeah. body I, as a mother, so, body as a lover. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I feel so powerful as a woman now. I feel so much more capable. I mm-hmm. feel strong. I feel like I know myself and I'm really proud of myself. Being a mum, becoming a mum gave me a sense of self-worth that mm-hmm. I've never had before. I think my insecurities surrounding that come from what other people think that other people can't differentiate, that you hear the word Mm -hmm. mother and something in that other person might, like the shutter might come down. Because it's not me. I know where the separation is. When I'm with my son, my son is my priority Mm -hmm. and I'm a good mum and I'm I'm proud of myself as a mum. But when I'm not with my son, when I'm having an experience and I know my son is cared for elsewhere and I can go and be be me, not a mum, I think my insecurities always, always sort of center around oh you're oh you're a mom oh you're a mom I see you differently now I was having a conversation in a pub with somebody the other day right. with a man okay who said oh you're not you're not a mom I was like sorry you know you're not a mom like not in my eyes anyway you're not you're not a mom <laughs> as in you're too sexy you're too whatever and it was pretty obvious that that's what it meant because obviously being yeah. a mom is the yeah. antithesis of all those things and it's like no they f- kind of feed into each other like the power mm. that I get from being a mum makes me an empowered person and to me I find that Absolutely. quite sexy in other people I find women who are empowered and know themselves Absolutely. and they're strong and resilient I find that incredibly sexy in a woman you know I think it's for me the 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 insecurity yeah. and the worry comes around people that I might be attracted to not being able to differentiate I can differentiate and I'm proud of my differentiation yeah it's just patriarchal views because people are like oh daddy but people aren't like oh mummy it's been turned into a sexualized thing for someone to be a dad to be a good dad to have a dad bod all of those things are sexualized mm. and then on the flip side to be a mother the person who birthed the child, yeah. it's completely the opposite. And uh, except for that small 5% area where you say MILF at someone. Right. And then that's meant to level it out and make it okay. But then that's glossed over. Like, what is that? It's a very strange, and yet, yeah, as you say, yeah, like the um, the daddy stuff is is still so prevalent. Um, oh, it's just and, outdated. And I find it so bizarre. It is all from a society that was set up to revere men and push down mm. Women, we're sadly, however many years on in the world we are, not out of the woods with that. You know, even talking about just sex in general, I receive a lot of backlash for being a woman and vulva owner who is willing to talk about sex so openly. And it's only ever from men and penis owners feeling offended by things that they don't need to feel offended by because my entire ethos is that we should all be working together to have better sex. It's not going, I blame you. We all need to work together to make a better society. And I think that the way that men and penis owners, women and vulva owners are looked at as parents in terms of being sexualized beings is just so completely opposite ends of the scale on that note how have you found dating as a single mother I'm still figuring out how to negotiate that like I went on a a couple of dates earlier this year and like the other great thing about being a mum is it's enhanced my bullshit detector like tenfold Mm -hmm. so like you know you cut to like second date with a guy and I can just tell that I can't, I don't feel comfortable bringing up my son in front of that person. Right. And I know that it's because he's uncomfortable. And so rather than wasting anyone's time, because I only get a couple of nights off, mm-hmm. um, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm like, does that make you uncomfortable? Yeah, it does. Okay, great. Good luck to you. Yeah. Like kind of, it was really easy to kind of disentangle myself from that dating situation before it got any further than what was necessary because the idea of me having a child made that person uncomfortable and like I'm not going to walk into a bar and say hi I'm Natasha I'm a mum like that's not me first and foremost but also it's that thing of when you drop that in what if I do meet someone at a bar and what if I do want to go home with them Mm -hmm. or I do want to take them back to mine wherever I'm staying like my home is a very protected place now it's my nest Mm -hmm. and it's my family home and I'm not really into the idea of bringing someone back personally for me I don't want people in my house that aren't really 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 close to Alf mm-hmm. that's because it's this is his domain not mine and I, I'm kind of thinking you know when do you when at what point in the evening do you go by the way I'm a I'm a mum and it's always just the assumption that if you are a single 
mum that you must be looking for a new dad for your for your oh. child <laughs> Yeah, like everybody seems to think it's like I'm I must be looking for Jerry Maguire. Like I must be Renee Zellweger with the cute little kid with the glasses, which ironically I, I am because I do have a cute little kid with glasses. This is the other thing is that I'm in, I'm in, I'm so intensely protective of the relationship that my son has with his dad mm-hmm. and that the relationship we share together. Yeah. Like we are so close and we are a family unit in a way and I'm really lucky that I've cultivated that. It's really funny because for somebody that grew up wanting a really long-term marriage and a load of babies and was actually quite traditional mm-hmm. I say in inverted commas but it's just something that I it's a situation that I've made the best out of yeah and fallen into and then the the difficulty comes then is like what it what what about when real feelings develop on either side for somebody else and I don't know you know it, in a way I'm relishing the freedom at the moment of not looking for that in my life because I have everything in my life I need for myself for my little boy and so I just want to have a good time yeah do you feel like there's a sort of bit of pushback at just being a single mother who might just want to have a casual good time with people yeah because people think it's a con right right (laughs) no I think they think they're gonna get punked and I'm like no really like please it's really fine don't don't worry yourself I don't I just want to have a good time I just want to like have a good connection and have a good time and maybe like have a good time a couple of times but like it's not Mm. you know and I I feel that like organically if something materializes something will materialize it's you know it's if it's meant to to be it will be there's no point in forcing anything I've done what I've needed to do over this time to cultivate the relationship and the love that I need for myself and for my little boy and I have that yeah you know the one thing that is missing is I don't have like the steamy bits at the minute (laughs) not as often as I'd like and well I feel like um, the attitude towards a single dad like sort of just being like I just want some casual hookups people would be like yeah hun you need to get yours but towards a single mother it's a bit like oh right well why would you need to be doing that? And it's like, yeah, well, because like, I'm a fucking sexual being too, if you don't fucking mind. Yeah, like those those feelings don't go away. I'm the same person. I just happen to be keeping a human alive. Yeah. And nurturing that human. And and, and I, yeah, it's not... The, the single mom stigma is is a really hard one yeah. and and, I, and I'm not I'm not gonna lie about it but then I'm also I'm also very much of the opinion that I do I do believe with the right support system you can do it yourself if mm-hmm. you want to have a baby have a baby a few friends of mine are very aware of their biological clock that ticking and and for them it's a prevalent thing it's something that it, within their lives they know they want to do and they're yeah. unsure how to facilitate it and I try and be quite positive about situations that are thrown at me and this particular situation I thank my lucky stars that I have fulfilled some a purpose that I did want to yeah, do yeah, and yeah. yes no the circumstances weren't perfect didn't nail it in terms <laughs> of what I wanted um or what I thought I wanted yeah. but I've I've done that I've had it so if I have another child which I'm open to great if I don't I'm a mother yeah. and I'm really proud of that and that's fine and that leaves me with other time to go off and keep sort of experiencing what I want to experience and and that you know, whether that's work, whether that's sex, whether that's, it's whatever I want really. Mm. And I think it's a really positive way of looking at it. I, again, like I also have friends who worry about time. I've often said you can do it alone. I know it's not everyone's preference. And again, we're not brought up in a way that we're taught how okay and doable that is. I mean, I don't think my mum listens to this podcast, but I know that at the time I was conceived, she had said to my dad, I'm having a baby. <laughs> Whether it's from you or not, I'm having a baby because I'm I'm doing it now. Which I think for her generation was quite radical. She was like, yeah, I'm not massively. hanging around anymore for you. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Like I yeah, I mean I definitely didn't have my ducks in a row. And um making that decision was a really hard decision and I made it for myself and I made it putting no pressure on the other people involved. It was something that I knew I had to do and I was prepared to to take the weight of what that meant. Mm-hmm. It's also put me in a position that I I don't feel the opportunities that I might have missed out on in having my child. I don't think I would have been ready to take having not had my child, if that makes any sense. Like the person I am, I don't think I ever would have grown into this human being if I hadn't have had him. Yeah. I don't think I would be this brazen. I definitely wouldn't be talking on a sex podcast. <laughs> like, but, but, and, and there is that thing, there's that thing of, and this leads into the stigma of like a woman, well, once she's had a child, what is expected of that woman? I've always found it 
a bit archaic. It's that idea that you should just sit and be content after you've had a baby. Yeah. And why should I sit and, and stay, stay quiet? Why should my son grow up, maybe listen to this one day, and why should he find fault at that? Yeah. Like, what's the... What's so icky about it? A lot of women are affected sexually after birth. And of course, that is something that is okay and valid and something that that needs speaking about. But I think it's also people don't seem okay with a woman being as sexual post children as she was before. Yeah, it's such a backwards way of thinking. You know, it's it's every element of sex. It's not just two people sex. It's yeah. like it's masturbation. It's yeah. all that stuff. It doesn't go away. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like I probably fall asleep halfway through a lot more than I used <laughs> You're like, to. I'm just tired. I want it. I'm too I'm tired. tired. <laughs> yeah. And like or, or like or like it'll be you'll be, be really going well and then you'll get Mummy, I want a snack. And you think, oh, for God's sake, like, this is just ridiculous. Like, it's, I mean, yeah, there are those situations, like, you get interrupted a little bit more, but that stuff doesn't go away. Mm. Like, for me, it didn't. Yeah. Um, Do you feel like your sex drive is sort of relatively the same as it was before? I mean, there was, there was that time where I felt like I was underwater and didn't know whether I was coming or going. And I think for some people, that time lasts a long time. And then you were on heat. Yeah, and then and then there was that time where <laughs> I couldn't think about anything other than that. And um, yeah, it, and then I, it sort of balanced back to the way it was. Like, I've always been quite a sexual person. Mm-hmm. I'm still the same person. And uh, that means that I still have the same... For me, I have the same sex drive as I always did. Yeah. Um, I'm just... I'm a little bit more limited in... in Fulfilling ways it. ways in which I'll go out and, yeah, get my kicks, I guess. Mm-hmm. If you can walk into a job interview with like sick down your back and you don't realise from like where you've been like burping and winding 20 minutes before or you can somehow like pull an all-nighter and that's not because you're out drunk at a club in Soho, it's because your child has colic. Mm -hmm. Like if you can somehow, you can somehow do all these things, then you like, you get into a sexual situation and you're like, bring it on, (laughs) like whatever let's do that that sounds fun give it a go yeah fine because you don't sweat the small stuff if something goes wrong if something feels embarrassing if something's icky if something's like what like if someone doesn't like something that happens it's not it's just sex yeah like and it will it will come and it will go and you'll probably do it again and it will be better and it will be worse and it will be not you know there is no good and bad but the experience will be good for you and then sometimes the experience won't be as fulfilling like it's it swings and roundabouts and I kind of I've lost that fear now I'm much more able to be in the present moment because your tolerance your bullshit tolerance goes up to such a point sure that you you're not phased by a lot of things yeah and um and I'm not phased by my body I'm really proud of it and I love it and I feel more confident now than I ever did before I was gonna say so your sexual confidence is maybe even at its highest yeah because it's all it's all interconnected with our relationship yeah, with ourselves absolutely. right Compa- 100%. and it's our, and I like myself parenthood has helped me and the biggest like sexual myself. organ is the brain so yeah mass yeah massive props to the brain it's more the cultural implications I think yeah. that have been the most difficult for me it's, mm-hmm. it's people's perceptions of you yeah and, um I think you know if people could just keep their minds open, Mm -hmm. there are so many, you know, women out there and women I know as well, who are also single moms, who are formidable, incredible people that are worthy of the same experience as those who haven't had children. Yeah. And just allow people to be sexual beings. Like we shouldn't be suppressing that side of people or trying to suppress that side of people just because they've had children. I don't know if you've seen the program, sex life on Netflix but it was one of the first shows I've ever seen where a woman in a marriage with what looked to be the perfect man from the outside world and they had their kids and all she wanted was to get fucked and it was like so almost shameful that she starts writing about a toxic ex who she had great sex with she starts writing about it to sort of like live vicariously through her own past and obviously it's a TV program, so it has it, all the far-fetched drama in the universe involved, but just the sort of like emphasis on the moments in that program where she's looked on with like shame for feeling that way, when actually it's perfectly okay to be a mother who just wants to get fucked. That's yeah, okay. absolutely. Like one of my like enduring memories of growing up as well was like I used to love Sex in the City and I know it has its place in time now. Mm-hmm. I remember when one of the characters had a baby, Miranda has a baby and she like brings this hot guy home and he's like 
he's like giving her one on the couch and then the baby starts crying and then she starts like shouting mummy's coming (laughs) I just like I'm like it's a really clear memory in my head and it's like what is what is so wrong about that situation do you know what I mean like what is what what is so wrong about wanting to go out and meet someone and Mm. we live in 2022 we all have to be safe we almost have to exercise precaution and some people don't don't like they'll prefer to go to somebody else's house if they're going to go home with someone or you'll get a hotel or whatever Mm -hmm. like whatever you need to do to feel safe and feel protected fine um but like there's there's nothing wrong with that with wanting to go out and get some like what why is it such a why am I doing I think it's the archaic view and it's and I find this is older women actually don't you feel like you're like you're kind of you're not serving your son in doing that don't you feel like you're somehow in his name you're not being the best mother by going out and having sex is that like how I don't understand the marriage between those two no. sub, those two things they are completely separate things and yeah. if I want to go out and have sex with somebody it has no bearing <laughs> on what I'm like as a mum. No, and also... Like they're, they're completely opposite. Having like an open, healthy, honest sexual life and sexual experience probably only provides you with the tools to teach your children how to have healthy, honest, open sexual experiences. Absolutely. And I mean, I mean, I... I mean, I'm not even going to say, oh, I, I have a son and therefore I have a duty. I have a child. Yeah. And therefore, how whoever that child grows up to love he alvi needs to know what love looks like in in a in a consistent and honest and open and caring way Mm -hmm. not it not some sort of closeted version of this is how you love somebody and this is the type of person you love and you don't love people that make these choices Mm -hmm. like that's not the way any any child I feel should be should be brought up yeah I want him to feel like he can love whoever he wants to love that he is secure in in how to love somebody um safely yeah because you know love love is a scary thing and and relationships are scary and relationships can be scarring and toxic and bad for you and they can also be wonderful for you and being able to cultivate hold those boundaries for yourself and hold your own self-worth and your own self-respect at the top is really important yeah um and I think if I was to just sit here every night and take up knitting or crochet which is just not going to happen to be honest (laughs) I mean I would not be holding any self-worth or any self-respect to myself at all because I wouldn't be respecting what I need yeah. like as a as a somebody with blood in their veins and mother like, is just that's... one facet or label you know I know we're also obsessed with labels but it's just one yes. all, these are all parts of you that make up one whole human it's not your entire identity is mother it's also not it's neither it's neither it should neither be a derogatory thing, nor should it be put on a pedestal. There are those of us who will never become mothers. Yeah. People that want to, people that don't want to, that will never have that future. And therefore, you know, in a way, it shouldn't be put on a pedestal. We all, loads of us do it. Loads of us don't. Some people are mothers. Some people aren't. Mm-hmm. That's it. And it's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just a choice. It's a choice I made that makes me happy. And it doesn't mean that my intellect can't be accessed and my skills can't be accessed and my body can't be accessed and my beliefs can't be accessed and my humour and my cooking skills and everything else. And your can't libido. Be by other people and my bloody libido, <laughs> yeah. In a purely sexual sense, I think, as you're saying, you have that newfound confidence in your body. and all. Do you think that you feel more sexually free now within, within, the, within your sexual experiences, as you were saying, because you don't sweat the small stuff? So do you think that you, that you feel more sexually free or more sexually open? I think because my relationship to sex has changed, you know, it doesn't come with an ulterior motive. Mm-hmm. My, my motivations for, I think, I think we're all guilty of, you know, climbing into bed with somebody because we hope it will turn into a relationship mm-hmm. or because we're hoping we'll feel they'll sort our self-esteem issues out or they'll yeah. take our mind off our ex. Like <laughs> we've all got, our own all got reasons for jumping into the sack, right? Yeah. I don't feel I have any ulterior motives for that now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in, in that way, I do feel free. And also just to be in the sweet spot of my child sleeps through the night. I'm no longer tired. I have the energy 
for the act and that to <laughs> yeah. me is a huge thing I don't even have kids and I've fallen asleep during sex before, oh, we all do that. So. Sex before yeah. well yeah, you we know you say but whenever I say that people are so shocked and I'm like oh whatever it's happened to me a few times I've fallen asleep people going down on me falling asleep whilst having sex sometimes we're just tired and I'm like listen I've had a lot of sex I've spent a lot yeah. of time in my life having sex and sometimes I'm just tired it's like Amazon sleepy time story sends me right off in 15 <laughs> minutes on a timer um <laughs> me personally I'm not really like into three hour sessions and I think Fine. I wonder what it would be like for somebody that takes a while and needs a lot of foreplay and, mm. and whatnot to get to a point like I've never really been like that great um so do you orgasm preference. more so, through so, penetrative sex anyway yeah I'm I'm quite lucky in you, that respect. You are lucky. It's true. What is it? Eighteen percent of the eighteen percent. Congrats. Eighteen <laughs> percent makes me want yeah, to feel like setting statistics. off a popper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Some I'm quite. Lu- I'm I'm lucky in that respect, and like, and in a way as well. That means that like when I when I get myself off, that's that that version's for me, and then sex. Like that's how I look at it. So for a masturbatory adventure. We're more on the clitoral side of things than yeah, for the partner. Yeah, it's the penetrative. 100%. Wow. Okay. No. And like actually, it. and actually, I think I would go as far as to say I'm quite territorial about it. I'm a bit like, no, that's not what you don't need to know about that. <laughs> but that's mine. Those of us with young children, the idea of doing like a whole eight hour full on session, like that is a lot of work. Like, um, we're going to need a nap. And a lo- yeah, and like you're gonna have to like you know you know like you, rather than going to a bar for like a sexy glass of wine, you're both stood there with some espresso. Like for, like come on, we can do this. It's an espresso like, martini I, or nothing. But often, like you know, life gets in the way at the best of times. So then, as parents, I wonder if making time for that kind of love making, I do, I wonder how feasible it is, and I wonder if sometimes that can be intimidating to somebody yeah. as a new parent. It might just not be feasible, sort of on a regular basis obviously on I think it was two weeks ago I spoke about um how to schedule sex yeah. because you know when you do have children even if you have opposite careers you know career hours sometimes that becomes mm. a necessity but but back to what you were saying about the foreplay thing one of the most interesting things that I have read is a lot of people who have had vaginal births so I'm someone who orgasms way way more um clitorally like I can have penetrative orgasms but it's not something that happens on a first time experience with someone and if I'm going to be ongoing with a partner with each partner I have we have to figure it out. we have to figure it out we have to have some not so sexy sessions and figure it on out um and then we can get there but it's not something that is like um that readily accessible just because our anatomies are all different aren't they um so for me that is the way I orgasm more however um even in women who are the same as me, a lot of women who have um, had vaginal births would rather start having penetrative sex with their partner again, even if it's a little painful because they're both, it feels like they're both in it together and they feel a lot more hesitant and nervous specifically about a partner giving them oral sex because it's a lot of attention paid to an area that. I still don't know that I feel all that confident about yet with your head mm-hmm. being right down there, right up in the business, you know. So yeah. so what's funny is even women who do orgasm more that way, they feel more comfortable starting out again with penetrative sex rather than foreplay, even though it helps them get to the end goal just because they've lost confidence in their partner being that close to that area. Yeah. I can understand that. I think, you know, I, as I touched on before with um, the first couple of times I did have sex after having my son, it it was more from my side, it was more for the bond, for the closeness. The intimacy. And for the, like, I've got, I've got you and I'm still here. I'm still me, mm-hmm. kind of in a, are you still you? Just checking in. Mm-hmm. Like that kind of level of connection is is something that I think I would definitely say I I went for well listen we've been sent some quite in-depth questions so shall we get into them yeah I'm going to put these two together because they're relatively similar they're just at slightly different age stages of the children so we can sort of answer both we you and I'll chip in as much as I can so question number one Is it okay to have sex with your baby in the room? That feels like such a strange thing to do, but they are obviously always there. 
And then the other question was, how can we have sex when the kids are in the house? So obviously these are slightly different stages of age in the children because obviously your kids get to a point where they're not in the same room. I reckon I can answer this one, you know. Can I Can I try? Well, well um, you're going to answer it a hell of a lot better than me. So yes, <laughs> please do. Um, I don't think I ever did have sex with the baby in the room. Just takes me out of what I'm what I'm doing <laughs> sure quite frankly you get some really high-tech baby monitors these days I've got a lovely one if you hear something then you know you need to st- like stop and go and sort the baby out but then again it's not like the visual and the actual presence is like you have to find a way to kind of have a little bit of distance I think yeah and I think if possible like even if that means you're having sex in the living room you know because you've only got one bed flat and as much as you know a baby doesn't know what's going on and will have no idea I can't imagine two people being able to completely shut off from the fact that and there be is present a third but yeah, yeah it's the same but it's this but I'm the same as like I'm I used to have two cats and I could never have sex with the cats in the room it would freak me out too much to have to lock them outside I mean listen my just, dogs funnily enough I'm rarely have people at my house like I'm very much like I'll come to yours so I can leave <laughs> yeah kind so of you get out of there um, yeah but a few people are allowed to to be at my house anyway so I had um sets the dogs were on the bed which is rare okay so normally I make sure they're on the floor or downstairs even in the living room or I'll give them to my housemate he gets it he knows what's about to happen he's like yeah cool I'll have them anyway things kicked off as they did the dogs were fast asleep at the end of the bed (laughs) so I was like this isn't going to be a problem anyway mid me giving this person a blowjob let me tell you (laughs) these two could not have been more interested in what was happening they were like (laughs) like trying to get right up in the business like one of the dogs was like wagging his tail (laughs) <laughs> getting closer and closer I was like listen you two gotta go because this, this is, is un- killing this is me <laughs> is- yeah um, obviously a human baby is slightly different to, to <laughs> very different. Um, I mean to animals can smell pheromones can't they so they they yeah, actively get involved well, exactly. but, but yes but it's but it's a but essentially it's a connect it's a connection you know to me sex is a connection between two people sure. and therefore if you can if you can fence off a little bit of room I, I always would and I just have a monitor on I have it on loud mm-hmm. and then you know that if you hear something you go because again I really do bow down to anybody that's that's going for too long <laughs> like to long enough to longer than a nap do you know what I mean sure. like if, it, if you're thinking you can go longer than the baby's nap then I bow down to you because that is that is <laughs> ludicrous i need at least 10 minutes of that baby's nap for myself (laughs) and then like the older kids in the house thing like I again this isn't something that I've had to deal with because I keep my sex life away from my home Um, I was one of five so from the flip side of it I think you've just got a chance maybe it's part of the danger isn't it (laughs) well I mean teenagers do danger wanks don't they yeah so maybe it's just it's danger sex yeah or like as you were saying earlier as well like it's just about knowing if you if it's if it's important to you, mm-hmm. then make it a priority. Yeah. And like skip the gym session or skip the dinner with mates that you've got scheduled in where your mum's going to have the kids for the night. Yeah. Like sk- skip that and go, do you know what? Tell mum and dad that we're going out for a meal with some friends and it's a really important birthday of, of a mate of ours. But actually what we're going to do is stay in with a couple of bottles of wine and like, actually have some time to ourselves. Like if it's if it's important to yeah. you, then make time. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, like, that's so you know true. What I mean? Making that making that time important enough, you know, getting my parents to take my son is like I they're like little golden tickets that I have to spread out across the year and make sure that I'm asking for that support when I really need it. So it's usually work. But like if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna solicit somebody to bet, do it. Yeah. Why not? It's important. And if it's if it's something for both of you that, that needs to happen, then it's, you know, it's self care and then you put it put your needs first and and also I just you know obviously no one wants their children to walk in on them having sex I completely understand and respect that worst case scenario it happens most of the time if kids are young enough that can be brushed off they're not going to think about it twice and you know what I mean they're going to be like what's going on you're going to be like oh me and daddy are playing and they're going to be like cool can I have a cookie you know what I mean like a lot of kids are like just not going to be that invested in it anyway or they're going to be of an age where you say well this is actually how it works I don't know why we're so afraid of teaching our children about sex in a healthy way and that's not our kids watching us have sex obviously that's 
obviously not. But yeah. if it happens that a child walks in and they're of a certain age where you are able to have a healthy and open conversation about it's something that is very much part of human adult life. I just don't think it's something that people need to be like so absolutely terrified of because yeah. it's something that that child is going to live from a certain age the majority of their life dealing with themselves anyway. I'm not suggesting yeah, we start think... talking to four-year-olds about sex. You know, obviously I'm talking like of a certain age and up. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think as well, like there is something to be said about, you know, you uh, libidos can be sensitive. Mm-hmm. And I think if it were me, I would probably be more worried about, this is my personality, I'd be more worried about my partner being put off the idea of having sex should the kids walk in Mm -hmm. that would be my concern and I think again if that's a concern if you've got if you're in a place in life where you're working really hard you know there's a lot of like outside stresses going on then again just schedule at that time in and make it a priority so that you know you're not going to be interrupted even if it's few and far between at least you know and it's worry free then Mm -hmm. and if that's your preference and that's your need then there's nothing wrong I don't think with with doing that no Um, I think we, scheduling sex priority. is great you know what I mean like better that I know people look at it and they go oh, isn't that boring but like 100% better that than just not and sort yeah. of letting your sex life go by the way like it's yeah, yeah absolutely definitely. it's important in terms of the baby in the room I mean listen I'm sure like there are some people out there who do find a way to do that and they're okay with it and obviously your baby is not going to know what's going on so it, it is okay to do it you know what I mean like so in terms of the question itself, yes, it is okay. But if it feels yeah. weird for you and it is affecting your sex life and you're in a position where you want to be having sex with each other and that is the thing that is stopping you, then take Natasha's advice because well, there's a the way around it. Run. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't see like, I don't see anything wrong with it. Mm-hmm. But it's really important when you have a baby to feel like you get back to that part of your relationship, isn't it? You yeah. get back to that part of yourself and therefore, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with, as long as baby is in within earshot or you have a monitor on like there's nothing there's nothing to feel guilty about Mm -hmm. by giving yourself that wall yeah that literal brick wall that much space between you and the baby for something that is going to essentially make you feel more stable as a human being and and in a partnership yeah Yeah, absolutely okay next up I mean we've sort of touched on this a few times throughout the episode anyway how do I start to feel sexy again Going from lover to mother has been such a huge transition. And whilst I'm in awe at what my body has been able to do, everything that felt sexual about my body now feels like it only exists to provide. How do I separate the two? I think it's a really personal thing. I think you, I I don't think it's something you can rush. I think we all take time and we take a different amount of time. Mm -hmm. I think you create your own narrative in this respect. And I think you, it's what you feed yourself. It's what you surround yourself with. Yeah. Like if you want to feel that way again, like watch that first movie that made you feel sexy that mm-hmm. you watched here yeah, for me, it was Dirty Dancing. Go back to those movies, go back to those books, go back to those moments, relive those moments, think about those moments because they're still part of you and who you are. Mm. That part of you hasn't gone. But at the same time, it's not something that you can rush. It, no. it, it will, like, I I honestly believe that it will come. Yeah. And often you're not expecting it. Yeah. And it just happens. But I think if you're worrying about its return and doubting its return, yeah. then you're going to be too busy worrying for it to just, for you to, it's healing, isn't it? Yeah, you, it you're is. You're healing from, it's a beautiful trauma. Mm-hmm. Motherhood is a mm-hmm. beautiful trauma and you have to, allow yourself to heal so that you know bits of bits of you slowly start to come back with that first bit of makeup you put on to that like time that you put on a bra that's got a wire on or that bra that you finally like your boobs have gone down enough that you finally fit back in it and you go oh yeah I remember this and then you sort of shove the nursing bra back on because it's way more comfortable but you know it bits of my mum always said that to me bits of you will come back slowly yeah and that is absolutely what it, it's like painting by numbers and you can't rush it and, and sometimes it's you? cultivating environments to make you feel sexy again so you know whether it's turn those lights down low and light some candles put on something that makes you feel sexy that makes you look in the mirror and go 
that's me as a lover. All of those things that, like you said, all of those things that made you feel sexy before. I always think that so many things come back to yourself. So I always think if you're talking from a place of not feeling sexy for your partner again, you might want to spend some time with your own body first, reconnecting with your own body. Mm -hmm. Because I think that we are of the idea that once you stop feeling sexy that's it but actually you can make yourself feel sexy I always recommend take some time for yourself reconnect with your own body touch yourself feel yourself in that way again as you said recultivate all those things that made you feel sexy before because they're all still a part of you yeah and also like if a couple of things have like dropped off the playing field you'll pick up other things. Mm -hmm. We outgrow things, we evolve. And Mm -hmm. and whether you have a child or not, the nature of being a woman is that we grow, we evolve, our bodies change. We go through so many changes. Yeah. So, so many changes physiologically and emotionally. And this is another change, but it's not the one and only change that you'll go through in your life. Mm -hmm. There will be more changes. And I think the less pressure you put on yourself, the better. I think as well, like we all feel like everyone always has to be fully naked during sex. And like, this is something, again, we talk about things that we've grown out of. So like, I'm a body confident person, not body confident, just body neutral. I don't care. Whatever my body's doing, it's doing. And that's fine. But I am always someone who has like never really been like that into being like fully naked during sex. And for such a long time, I was just kind of like, well, I will because this is what we do, right? But then I got to a point where I was like, no, if I want to wear something during sex, it, it's no reflection on how I feel about my body. It's just what I what makes me feel sexy. And actually, if I'm having sex, I want to feel sexy because it's how we cultivate our best sexual experiences is if we feel good about ourselves. So I think as well, if you do feel like there are parts of your body that you feel disconnected from, you don't necessarily have to be like fully naked and feel like all of those parts of you are on show. Like it is perfectly okay to even when you are in the absolute throes of penetrative sex, still be wearing something. Yeah. And that's perfectly okay. I would, I would a hundred percent. I wouldn't even give it any like extra thought. I wouldn't feel like I'd half, I've, I'd shortchanged anybody by having a t-shirt on. Mm-hmm. Take some time for yourself to revisit all of those things that made you feel sexy before children and take some time to reconnect physically with your own body and rediscover what you like because you might even like something, as we've said, you might like something different now. A different part of your body, those parts of your body that feel like they are providing and maybe feel a bit overtouched, especially if we're speaking about boobs. You know, you might feel like my boobs are touched out. But what I've actually discovered in my self-discovery is that I like this part of my body being touched now. And that feels like an erogenous zone. So you might discover that completely different parts of your body are erogenous zones. And you can then separate them because they will be part of you as a lover now that are not providing for someone else, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I had a baby a few months ago and whilst I love my partner and feel the desire to have sex with them, I'm honestly just terrified. Is it going to feel very different? Obviously, this has been a different situation for you because as we've said, I'm presuming maybe this person had a vaginal birth and so they're worried about physically how that is going to feel. Yeah, it depends. I mean, I, I mean, and I don't know, I'm not the only person in the world that's had a C-section. I mean, maybe some people have felt very different. Mm-hmm. Having sex after yeah, C-section. yeah, yeah, I don't absolutely. Know. And, and again, this is this is where these questions are difficult to answer and in, in, challenging in a respect because um, everybody's birth is different, extremely different to, to each other, the same way as we're all different as human beings, the same way as your return to sex and how that feels for yeah. you is going to be different because it also, it's also, I think so much to do with your headspace. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and it's something, if you're terrified of something, it's never going to feel great. It's most pleasurable. It? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. I think again, like the same advice that you said before Peach, where you said you need to, you need to perhaps get to know your own body a little bit mm-hmm. again first I think your relationship with yourself is the most important thing and if you're feeling terrified being able to communicate that yes absolutely and taking That's what I was time say. yeah is the most important thing because even if it doesn't feel the same like and even if you know, it doesn't it might not feel great the first time I was gonna but... say and even if it doesn't you just go okay well this time was not great <laughs> 
But that first great. time will still be special. It will be it's special. It's still going to be yeah. special because it's still the first time you've had sex after having a baby. Mm-hmm. And that's not just you. That's your partner as well. Mm-hmm. It's That's a first for that person too. It's a shared first. And maybe maybe when you're ready to do so, you know, focusing on the connection of that yeah. and it being, you know, I think I lost my virginity to somebody that was losing their virginity mm-hmm. at the same time. You know, there aren't many other moments in our sexual lives and journeys where we get to experience a first together yeah yeah yeah. you know and like that is that's a big first that's the first time you two are having sex after becoming parents and that's a big thing and maybe maybe the emotional side of it and maybe the explorative side of it that's what that first time is for yeah and then you can meditate on the other stuff later yeah um and not every sexual encounter you have has to be the sexiest experience of your life you know what I mean so even if you Mm -hmm. try and you're like this is an absolute nightmare you can like laugh it off together and 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 put it down to a a story I I think obviously as I would say to anyone in this kind of situation communication is is everything and I would like to believe I would like to believe I know it's not the case because we're just not taught to talk about sex, but I would like to believe you've just had a child with someone. And especially as you're saying, you love them, you have desire for them, that you are able to have a conversation with them, that you're able to say to them, hey, I love you. I really want to have sex with you, but I'm fucking terrified. So do you mind if we stop? If yeah. it's not feeling great? Absolutely. Like, Can what? we take There's it slow? Wrong with that. Can we use... Yeah a whole bottle of lube, you know, like, can we do whatever it's going to take to sort of try and make it the least scary experience we can together? Because I think once you've had that conversation and you feel like you're in it together, that's going to feel so much less scary anyway. So I would say, just tell your partner and I would say, take it slow and use a whole bottle of lube. We know I'm obsessed with lube. So (laughs) I'd be like, literally line it up, all the different types. (laughs) So I think this one is from a dad. I thought that being there for the birth of my child would be magical. But the experience has affected me very negatively. It was quite a traumatic birth. And I'm struggling to feel the desire to be intimate with her. She can tell there is something wrong and misses sex and... I know she's the one who actually had to go through it, but how can I tell her how I feel? I think like, I actually, I think to care enough to ask two relative strangers that question needs acknowledging yeah. that that is, that is it's to, to be somebody that cares enough to ask that question. And we, and again, hugely positive, you know, I try not to blame and like, yes, sometimes just because of the way things have gone about sometimes men and penis owners get a bad rep a lot Mm -hmm. of times in the sexual sphere but no one talks about that no one talks about how it might feel to watch a literal baby come out of your partner's vagina and yes for some people it may feel magical and for some people it might feel fucking scary you know so like props to you for being honest about it and I am sure you are not the only person to feel this way. No, no. And and also, like, from, from the point of view of somebody that has knowing, that has is, is been in a situation knowing there's something wrong, I'm wondering if it was if it was that shower that you had to have that they had to help you do because you couldn't stand up because you just had surgery but you couldn't get the blood off and you had to wash the blood. Like, I literally had to go through that. Mm-hmm with Al's dad he had to put me in the shower at the hospital Mm -hmm. and I remember I remember thinking about it and thinking oh was that uh, maybe I should have gotten a nurse to do that maybe I shouldn't have like literally you think about everything Mm -hmm. when you feel when you can feel a a partner changing in the in the way that they relate to you as a as a woman outside of being you know the the mother of your child yeah it's a really scary place to be and and having and, and having had first-hand experience of sitting and thinking I know that there's something wrong and I can't do anything about it. Communication is all that you need. Yeah. And and even if you're not ready to talk about it right now, you know, making your making it a priority to get yourself to a place where you can be honest mm-hmm. and and first and foremost be honest about the things that are there right now mm-hmm. and the things that 
aren't as at the forefront of your agenda in terms of what you want out of your relationship at this point, at this time. I think it's so important. And also just be mindful of the fact that birth is a beautiful trauma. And if you're in that situation, having to unpack and deal with a lot of your own things as well. And that's okay. Just because you didn't do it doesn't mean that you don't that you aren't have a right to feel affected yeah. by it and forever changed. It is a huge deal. It's a massive, massive thing. I do think a lot of partners of people who have, have given vaginal birth may feel like to speak out and say that people go, oh, well, you didn't have to fucking do it. So how fucking dare you? Do you know what I mean? Your partner's just gone through this and how. But it is, it is true. We do... We do have to look at both sides and we do have to realize that like, yes, physically you didn't give birth, but we all have our attachments to certain things. I personally don't know if I were to ever have children, if I were to have a vaginal birth, if I would want my partner to be at that end of my body. You know what I mean? I'd probably be like, stay by my fucking head because that would be one way for me in which I would separate sex and mother. You know what I mean? Like me as a sexual being and me as a mother because I'd be like, you don't need to see it like that. (laughs) Stay up by my head. I can understand, but it's exactly that. I know you say, how can I tell her how I feel? Well, it's like I sort of recommend when people are having any kind of sexual conversation is you surround it with compliments and surround it in good things, but you find the right moment within that to say, I feel affected by this. This may be some some more time. Yeah. Yeah. And this may be something that requires two people to go and speak to a counsellor. Because it may be sort of like a trauma that is sitting in someone's head and they can't get past it. I also think redeveloping intimacy outside of being fully sexual is going to be important because you're going to have to redevelop that connection. And also, it really has to be acknowledged that we have all these pheromones as those that birth the child. We Mm -hmm. get all of these pheromones and these hormones that tell us to love our child. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, the other side of that team is presented with the baby Mm -hmm. and told to love it. Yeah. And yet, some, some people find it really easy to look into the eyes of that baby and bond with that baby and feel like a father or feel like a mother or feel like the you know is a, in equal in in terms of parenting sure. and some people don't yeah some people it takes time and you know that is a, a seismic shift in someone's life and if that has dampened your libido for a little bit give yourself a break mm-hmm. but just keep the heat on the communication so that you're not leaving somebody in the dark who is already just as vulnerable as you are if not more yeah purely because of the physical changes yeah. there's a direct link between being physical with somebody and physically undergoing uh, a child coming out of your body there is that there is a link there and that needs to be respected and that can be respected as you said peach through communication mm-hmm. but give yourself a break we all go through stressful times at work when we don't have a high libido because we can't stop thinking about work and we're not sleeping or we have illnesses we manage chronic illnesses that destroys our libido mm. divorce all sorts of things mm-hmm. can can dampen and destroy our need for sex this is just one of them and it's okay that's fine mm-hmm. it doesn't mean it's permanent I think as long, but you need to preserve those bits of the relationship that you can preserve for when it does come back. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's done through communication and honoring the feelings of the other person, but it's not a bad thing. I think to say they can tell there's something wrong and that they miss sex. There's just nothing worse than feeling like you're in limbo and feeling like you can tell that something is wrong, like you've said, and not knowing what it is and what you can do. And although honesty to say, Hey, listen, I watched that baby come out and it's kind of affected how I view that area and I feel a little bit traumatized by it. Yes, that might seem like a particularly like difficult and harsh thing to say and it can be worded in a way that is not harsh and is actually incredibly kind and considerate. But whilst it's a difficult thing to say, all we can do is be honest with each other and even though sometimes honesty is hard to hear, when we know the truth, we can forge a path forward. But mm-hmm. when we don't know what's going on, we're just nowhere. And I think that once you've had that conversation with your partner, as difficult as it is going to feel, you will already feel better because it's out in the open. And that already just makes things feel so much better. You just surround it in compliments and how amazing she's doing and just 
be honest and you won't be the only person to have to have ever felt like that and also I think having again having been on the receiving end of that kind of information pick your words yeah and stick to your words don't feel like you have to find a million and one ways to explain the way you're feeling. If you've thought about and sat with your feelings and you know how you feel and you deliver it, as Peach said, in a in a way that is sensitive to that other person and, and in amongst things that build them up, no matter how much, you know, we want to gain control over that situation and do something about it, we can't fix that for you. Mm-hmm. Don't feel like you have to find another way to explain it mm-hmm. because I think it just muddies the water. Be clear and concise and stick to it because it is valid. Everything in post childbirth limbo is valid. Yeah. On both sides. Yeah. And if you find that you need to go and speak to someone professionally about it, there's no shame in that. You know, that's what they exist for. That's something I wish I'd done. I really wish I'd done that. I really wish I'd pushed for that. Yeah. And I didn't. And I really regret that. Because I think it would have had, you know, whatever the outcome, I think there would have been more clarity moving forward. I would always recommend looking into it. Yeah. Therapy or counselling. I mean, I think everyone should go at some point. There's always many untapped demons that we are unaware of. Mm. I think especially because, you know, there's so much shame surrounding sex and everything to do with it it is still one of the most untapped areas of therapy because people are embarrassed to go and speak to someone about it, but it's so important. I mean, it can be life-changing. I'm not ashamed to say I've been in sex therapy three times in my life. (laughs) Okay, we've got two questions left. I have zero desire to have sex with anyone and I'm three years postpartum. I've been to the doctor, nothing medically wrong with me. Please tell me I'm not alone. Well, you won't be alone because whatever you feel, no one's ever alone. You know, there will be someone out there who is 10 years postpartum and hasn't want to have sex anymore. What I will say is the whole been to the doctor, nothing medically wrong with me because I dealt with this when we, when I spoke to Katie about vaginismus, it's women going to the doctors and being told, no, you're fine. And the lack of care and time put into women and their libidos and their sex drives because as we've said before if a man or penis owner went to the doctor and was like this is going on we know a lot more care would be put into finding out why that has happened and how it can be solved and i've definitely had conversations with friends who feel the same way and and uh, you know they have uh, children of a similar age to 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 a 3 year old i don't think it's uncommon i don't think it is a necessarily permanent thing mm-hmm. I think that uh, aside from, you know, seeing seeing somebody who specialises in mental health, besides that, I think still carrying on on that journey of finding out who you are now mm-hmm. and the person you are now is the most important thing and knowing yourself now, you know, these are all, our, our fears and our worries are always so, so linked around societal expectation. Yeah. And that idea of bouncing back, bouncing back with the body, bouncing back with the sex life and having it all immediately is not, achievable no. and it's not realistic and just because your journey back to that part of you is taking longer or perhaps it's altered forever and that again is worthy of the utmost yep. respect and the utmost space and I would imagine that all those near to you who love you will hold space for you if that if that is your choice to to perhaps step away from having sexual experiences then that is your prerogative it's your life we only get about an average of four thousand weeks on this planet and forcing Gosh. yourself into any box or any sense of permanency with anything i think is is madness especially because you've also done this amazing thing of keeping a human alive for three whole years yeah absolutely. Um, so it's it's time isn't it nothing is linear no and you're so right and also i'm still waiting to have someone come on and speak about this with me who identifies within the asexual community but there's no space in society for people who don't have those feelings ever you know and there's a huge community Mm. of people who just don't have those urges and don't have those feelings and that's not spoken about the adequate space is not made for people who identify in the asexual community and so if you don't have those desires and you don't have those urges it's okay it's absolutely okay. And you shouldn't feel forced to. If you feel like you want to want to, then again, I would suggest maybe speaking to a therapist as opposed to a doctor because they're going to go, you look fine. Everything's great. But yeah, I just echo everything Natasha has said. 
it may be that postpartum you is different and you don't have those urges. And if you don't and you are happy and comfortable in your life, you don't need to want them. You don't need to desire it. Whatever it is that we choose to to prize and to put our time to in our lives is worthy of respect. And I think that that comes from from you first and foremost. And I think as long as you can be okay with your how you how you feel then that's the most important thing you need to be okay with how you feel yeah rather than you know making sure that this is this is a problem that you you feel is a problem not a problem that you feel other people will feel as a problem yeah you know absolutely Um, but if it's something that you're missing then yeah it's 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 likely that it's it's just not back yet and I'm sure that a visit to the right kind of counselor the right kind of therapist will help you discover how to get back to that yeah Absolutely. And just take each day as it comes because it may well reappear tomorrow. I also don't know there isn't any details in the question as to whether there is a partner involved or anything like that. If there is, that again is something for you to work through together because if if after three years that's a problem or you feel like there's any pressure or you feel like that is something that needs addressing, then again, all I can recommend is going and speaking to a therapist about it. But if you are living your life as a single parent and there isn't a partner involved and you feel happy and comfortable with the way you live your life just keep taking each day as it comes there's no pressure there's no timeline we all live our lives differently last question how to navigate sex during pregnancy I really can answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, look, it's physically impossible to poke the head of the baby. That's like the thing that everyone freaks out about, right? <laughs> but that is just not, is not going to happen. And all the books told me so. I mean, I think it's whatever's comfortable, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Whatever's comfortable. Like, and if you both want to do it, then do it. I did it. How did you find I it? I liked it. I quite liked it. I was more worried about him. Like, sure. it's cl- classic, more worried about the other person. Sure. And I mean, I think some people really dig it. Some people are ambivalent. Mm-hmm. Some people can't stand the idea, in which case that's why people masturbate, I guess. Yeah. Definitely something that I was grateful to have like that as an option <laughs> if I needed it. <laughs> I didn't like stop feeling sexy for nine months it just doesn't really happen yeah did you feel like certain positions became less accessible I mean I was huge like (laughs) like by the point like (laughs) so like I like I I I mean I wasn't I never like I don't think I ever had sex like heavily pregnant Mm. like to the point where like because because you get to a point where it is like driving a spaceship around (laughs) and like even like the act of turning over at night is like a gargantuan like like mythological quest that we have to go on so like by that point I wasn't that bothered about it anyway Mm -hmm. because I had all sorts of other things going around in my head like this like human that was gonna come and need me for however long but I think it is it's whatever's comfortable like I quite like I quite like doggy I think Mm -hmm. yeah that just felt most comfortable it felt that felt good Obviously, like, missionary, a bit weird. Wouldn't recommend. Like, it's in the way. <laughs> it's like, well, it's just like, it's literally like, it's like... In the middle of the two of you. Coming between <laughs> you. <Yeah. laughs> it's like... It's literally like the remark, like, yeah, it's that's, that's like, you're trying to, like, defeat this obstacle that's, like, literally there. Yeah. Like, so maybe not that one but I think it is it's just whatever's comfortable isn't it how far into your pregnancy would you say that you were able to sort of maintain having sex for I want to say like five or six months Mm -hmm. you know I was like I'm a really really impatient person I have no patience in life in anything whatsoever and so I got to like seven months pregnant and was like I'm done get it out (laughs) finished like I'm done now come now come now I like couldn't it was awful it was like the worst wait and like you know that's another like offset of being an actress isn't it you're constantly waiting to know if you've got a job or not and Mm -hmm. it just felt like the longest wait ever it was like I've been on eight rounds of Wicked or something (laughs) bloody tell me like it's still with the producers in America yeah okay (laughs) No, that's how it felt. It's a nightmare. You're like, especially um, now I'm not having sex anymore. Let's get it out. Yeah, yeah. Like, then nothing good can come of this time. <laughs> except for the growing and the necessary bit. And like, oh God, like uh, the sleeping I would do if I could go back and change that now. The sleep, I would just never get out of bed. Oh my God. So yeah, my, my advice is 
to get more sleeping in instead of like worrying about it. Just give things a go. Yeah, you just like it's li- it's like again, it's like if somebody like goes and has knee surgery and then they have to have sex with again, like mm-hmm. having had surgery on like or or if somebody's been really poorly or if someone's been away or like there's there's loads of different things that can happen in our lives besides being pregnant and having a baby that can alter the way that we have sex for a while. Yeah. I mean, and, you like, might love missionary. <laughs> Yeah. And like knowing that knowing that it's not going to be the same Mm -hmm. doesn't mean doesn't make it, you know, not worth doing. No, Um, and I think navigating, it always comes back to the same thing with me. And I always just think, gosh, people who listen to this podcast must be like, well, she just says the same thing all the time. But even though I'm not a fully qualified sex therapist yet, any sex therapist, any sex educator I listen to says the same thing. So I feel like I'm in good company, but it all comes back to talking about it. So if you want, yeah. if you're pregnant and you want to have sex with your partner, then talk about it. Talk about what is comfortable for you. Talk about what your boundaries are and also allow yourself that space to try things and be like, oh my God, absolutely not. And fall about laughing and either try something else or take a break and pick it back up later. <laughs> yeah. And and like, and also like if you're watching something on, on the couch and stuff starts to happen, don't think about it too much. Just go with just it. Crack on. Mm. Don't get out of like it, you know. It's about it's about being in the present moment, isn't it? Taking a situation as it comes, loving it for the bits kind of that we like, and loving it for the bits that we don't. Yeah. Like it's all experience. Yeah. So as with everything, just talk about it and dim the lights. Just dim the lights. You'd be amazed <laughs> at what you can talk about it with. and dim the lights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talk about it whilst dimming the lights. <laughs> just talk about the lights. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I mean, listen, we, you know, we, I think we always look at this stuff from like a, a female vulva in a point of view, but a man penis owner is going to want to have sex, I'm sure, during a pregnancy too. So just make sure the communication is aggressive. I'm all about not aggressive as in talk to each other in an aggressive tone. I say aggressive communication as in like, just talk about fucking everything. <laughs> and I also would say as well, actually, you know, like a lot of people talk about a baby moon, they go away for a few days. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of thing can really help because, sure. you know, your base, your home becomes this like weird supermarket filled with nest um, right start nesting yeah but like you just like that you look in one corner and there's a pile of baby clothes you look in another corner and there's that cot you haven't put up and like maybe taking yourself out of the situation as well you know you feel a bit sexy when you're in a hotel or an airbnb that's like a good one yeah i said that the other week children or no children in long-term relationships sometimes you just need to get out of your space we all know that Mm -hmm. hotel sex hits different (laughs) i don't even know why i don't know the science behind it i don't i should look it up i don't know the science behind it but it just does (laughs) it is a truth universally acknowledged yeah (laughs) that's that hotel there's something about hotel sex which endures the test of time um i and like as a parent as well i like i um i don't really have valve's toys out Mm -hmm. so at the end of the day I storm everything away so that my space becomes my adult space sure and um and I find that really helps so whether like you know you know making sure that you have a space that's yours that is your space to exist in as you as a person I think is really important and if that's the place that you feel comfortable having sex in Mm -hmm. then maybe that will help as well and that's for people that have had babies and not had babies you know I I have a thick you know my my living room is not I don't see Buzz and Woody until the next morning when they come out of the box. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, that's, that's great. Just silly things like that can really like change the mood, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because it's, as we've said, separating those parts of yourself as as lovers and parents, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for coming on today and talking for hours and hours and hours with me in the first of many conversations about sex after children so thank you so much for imparting your wisdom and being open and vulnerable because it is a a vulnerable thing to speak about so I know that everyone listening will really appreciate it and if you wouldn't mind before we wrap up the conversation just dropping your socials so that anyone listening can follow after today Oh, like speak them. Yeah, like your oh. your Instagram handle. You have to keep that in. <laughs> um, what did you think I meant? I don't know. Like I thought you wanted me to put like a magic box somewhere. No, no, no. <laughs> Just say them out loud. <laughs> you can follow me at Natasha J Barnes Music. Uh, on Instagram, I think there's a J in there, mm-hmm. and Natasha J Barnes on Twitter, and I think that's it. 
Great. That's, that's where I am. Nowhere else. As simple as that. Thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, thanks for having me. I loved it. Thank you for being so fantastic. It's needed, especially when I'm making Arby's dinner and I've got you in my <laughs> in my in my AirPods. <laughs> I'm listening to you talking about the stuff you get up to. <laughs> thank you very much. No, you've been amazing and thank you so much. I am so grateful to Natasha for coming on today and being the first parent to speak to me about her experiences so openly. And I hope this opens the door for more people to enter the conversation comfortably and confidently. Just because people become parents doesn't mean they all of a sudden stop becoming sexual beings. In the same breath, some people's sexual wants and desires might not bounce back at the speed they'd like it to. Whatever your experience is, it's completely valid and it's important. It deserves to be heard and supported without judgment or shame. As someone who doesn't have children, it's not an experience I can personally speak on, but I can only promise I will continue trying to create a safe, open space and community for others to share their experiences and know that there is nothing but support and understanding for you here at Sex on the Peach. And I'm sending love to all of those refinding their sexual journeys post-children. I hope to see you back here next week. Thanks for coming. Thank you for tuning in to Sex on the Peach today and I hope that you enjoyed this week's episode. You can find and follow me on Instagram, YouTube and TikTok at Sex on the Peach Cast and you can also get in touch with me at sexonthepeachcast at gmail.com. Please do continue to like, share, subscribe, rate and review wherever you listen to your podcasts and I'll see you next week. Love, Peach.